Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. I want to read this text again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. You ought to have this committed to memory. But beginning in verse 1, Matthew chapter 5, we're told, in seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Might the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word this morning. As we continue on for study here in the Beatitudes, this morning I want us to turn our attention to this seventh Beatitude spoken of right here in verse 9 of our text. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. <clears throat> the word used in our text, speaking of peace, most of the time I'll do these word study things a little bit farther into the lesson, but I wanted to talk about this early on. But the, the word used there in our text, speaking of peace, is the Greek word Irene, just like kind of like Irene, the name that we use. And, and it's speaking about harmonious relationships. And usually when we hear of peace, we associate that with uh, the absence or the uh, cessation or the ending of war and trouble. Uh, but, you know, even in a situation uh, in which a land lies devastated and cities are in ruins and uh, with men, women, and children starving, you know, if, if the wars come to an end, we likely we would say that peace has returned to that area. And in one sense, peace has returned. But in another sense, those people are a long ways from experiencing peace. So the peace got a broad, broad meaning. We're going to talk about this for a while. But for the Jew, the, the peace had a far wider meaning than just a cessation from war. That Greek word that I referenced a moment ago, a moment ago Irene, it translates the Hebrew word shalom. Uh, how many of y'all ever watched NCIS? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, what was her name? Zeba David. She would say Shalom. And uh, so we're all familiar with that. We've seen it on TV or in the movies. And it's a Jewish greeting or farewell uh, meaning peace or peace be with you. And that word Shalom, it has two meanings. It describes a, a perfect welfare, a serenity, a prosperity, a happiness. The Eastern greeting is Salam. And that greeting does only, it, it not only, it, it does not only uh, wish a man freedom from trouble, but it wishes him everything which makes for his uh, contentment and his good. Now for the Jew, peace is a condition of perfect and complete positive well-being when they say that shalom. And, and second, shalom describes a right personal relationship. It, it describes an intimacy, a fellowship, uh, uninterrupted goodwill between man and man. Uh, it can easily be seen that peace does not describe only the absence of war and strife, but it describes a happiness and well-being of life. It describes a perfect human relationships. And, you know, for the past couple of months, due to the conflict in Israel with them battling the Hamas, we've often heard Psalm 122 reference praying for the peace of Israel or Jerusalem. And we're told in Psalm 122, verses 6 through 8, it says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall, they shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Now the psalmist here is praying that every good blessing should descend upon the city and upon its citizens. That's the peace that he's speaking of. Not, of course, freedom from war is a part of that. But he's speaking of something much deeper. That inward peace. You know, some examples of this peace are of a harmonious relationship between men 
Uh, some examples are, the first one is between men or between nations, between friends, and most importantly, that harmonious relationship between God and man. That is the ultimate peace that will lead to all other forms of peace. Jesus came to this earth as an ambassador for peace. Think about that. He came to this earth as an ambassador for peace in order to reconcile man to God through his shed blood on Calvary's cross. He is the ambassador of peace, the only true peace. You know, the words peacemaker and peace and peaceable and peaceably, they're all related and they are a central theme throughout the whole New Testament. You know, the word is used in every New Testament book with the exception of First John. And here in our text, Jesus pronounces blessing upon the peacemaker and he adds the promise, for they shall be called the children of God. This is getting into next week's lesson, but when he said they shall be called the children of God, it's, what that means is they shall be owned as the children of God. Sons of God is what that's talking about. But Jesus came preaching and teaching a much different message than what the Jews expected out of a conquering Messiah. You know, the Jews in general, they regarded the Gentile nations with a bitter contempt and, and a hatred. They actually expected that under the Messiah that there was going to be an assault made upon these nations till they were completely destroyed or they were subjugated to the chosen people of God, the nation of Israel. I mean, that's what, was what they had in mind when he showed up on the scene, laying his claims that he was the Messiah. And, and they, they have made very well expected what they had read in the book of Joshua concerning the conquering experiences of their forefathers. That was the kind of what they was looking for. They wanted all that stuff to be done away with, what they were experiencing at that time. You know, in their estimation, uh, they who would be happy and blessed was going to be those who witnessed or partook in the Messiah avenging Israel of the heathen nations for all the wrongs that they had done to Israel and to free them from the bondage of Rome. It was nothing done to Israel that God didn't allow to be done to Israel. If you're a student of the scripture, uh, you know, Rome had occupied the land for much longer, much longer than our European ancestors have been on this continent. And before Rome, it was the Greeks. And before them, it was the Assyrians. And before them, it was the Babylonians. So those Jews, they no doubt, they had a chip on their shoulder. And in all likelihood, Jesus' message of peacemaker, that wasn't what they expected. Oh, but it was certainly what they needed. And they need it yet to this day. As a nation, they need it. And they will get it one day. But, but how different is the spirit of this new economy that Jesus came teaching and preaching? This one that he was ushering in. Now we hear, as spoken in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, speaking of the preacher, the gospel of peace. How shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Uh, how beautiful does this go along with, uh, does it agree with what we have read several times over these past several weeks when that multitude of a heavenly host were told that they praised God, that they said in Luke chapter 2 verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Good will toward men. See, this seventh beatitude, it has more to do with conduct than with character of the believer. But certainly that conduct, it's still a product of that indwelling character that is a result of the indwelling of the Spirit of God. It's a product of the Spirit of God. And there must first be a peaceable spirit before there can be an active effort to put forth or to make peace. Person's got to have a peaceable spirit about them, or they're not going to have any interest in being a peacemaker. You know, uh, you know. Each week we've been reminded that these beatitudes are, are progressive in nature. They kind of like a, a ladder or ascending up a ladder. And and I have to agree with what some of the writers that I've been studying. Uh, it seems like the higher you go up, the tougher they get. <laughs> you know, they they're building on one another, and the higher you progress, the tougher they get. And, and each one shows a slightly higher level of maturity. 
as they build upon one another. Uh, the first four might be grouped together as setting forth the negative graces of their hearts. First of all, they're not self-sufficient, or we're not self-sufficient. We're consciously poor in spirit. Secondly, they're not self-satisfied, but rather they're mourning because of their spiritual state. It's a continuous action. Thirdly, they're not self-willed, but rather they're meek. Fourthly, they're not self-righteous, but hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of another one. And then the next three, the Lord names the positive graces. Remember we talked about having tasted of the mercy of God, they are merciful in their dealings with others. That's the only way one can really truly be merciful, is having experienced mercy. Having received a spiritual nature, they now hate impurity and they love holiness. And having entered into the peace, that's what we're talking about this morning. Having entered into the peace which Christ made by the blood of his own cross, they now wish to live in peace with all around them. They don't want to be contentious. We shouldn't. Don't want to be a troublemaker or to be contentious. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And, you know, the role of peacemaker, that's very adverse, or we could say oppositional to the, na the nature of the natural man. It just don't fit. It just don't fit. And the reason it don't, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but the natural man is consumed with me first. The me first mentality. And it's hard to be a peacemaker with that mentality with your own selfish interest. Well, every one of us is guilty of that in some form or another, probably some worse than others. But this very fact highlights, or it takes note of the horrible contention, the enmity that sin has brought into the world. Uh, you know, where there is no strife, there's no need for a peacemaker. Paul wrote in the epistle to Titus, in verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, he said, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. So uh, let us not forget that declaration of those first words of this text that I just read to you. For we ourselves also were. That sounds like everybody. To some, some degree, we ourselves also were. You know, and from time to time, it'll peep through again. And we'll be reminded from where we've been bought and brought. Yeah, it will. It'll remind us of that. And, and, and thank God this text brings into view the triumph of God over the devil. You know, grace has been bought in that, uh, that which even now in part and in the future completely displaces the vile works of the flesh. You know, to be a lover and a worker after peace, it's one of the distinguishing marks of those who are a follower of the Prince of Peace, of those who are indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. You know, that miracle of grace which has made them at peace with God causes them to regard their fellows with a, a, what you would call a sincere benevolence. We care about people. We should. We should. Desiring to promote their best interests, both here and, and, and hereafter. You know, this world, this world don't know it and they don't want to acknowledge it. But this world is indebted to the presence of the peacemaker that Jesus is speaking of. You think about what, in the name of Christ, what's been done for society in hospitals and in education and in the church. The world is indebted to the peacemaker. In just a few verses here, Jesus is going to be uh, teaching on how the believer, uh, this disciple, uh, how he's the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You know, in that day to come when God removes that restraining grace and when he removes the instruments of his restraining grace, this world's going to realize how indebted they are to the peacemaker when all that is taken away and the calamity sets in. The Spirit of God will be gone. God's people will be gone. I can't imagine uh, uh, such an existence. <clears throat> but there is a difference between uh, simply loving peace and, and being a peacemaker. You know, this lovely Christ-like disposition, it, it's much different from that easygoing, what you might say, lethargy, 
which is many times, uh, you could even go so far as to say it's just selfishness or cowardness. Uh, and they call it being a peacemaker. No, it ain't really being a peacemaker. It's just I don't want to get involved or I don't want to do anything to help it. It's not a peace at any price which the Christian loves and aims to promote. Uh, such a thing is a false peace. James wrote in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, he said, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And note those words, he said, first pure. That wisdom that is from above is first pure. Peace is not to be sought at the expense of righteousness. It's important that we don't lose the connection to the previous beatitude. Remember that purity of heart. We talked about how these things progress and they build upon one another. We can't lose that connection to that purity of heart. Verse 8 qualifies the peace of verse 9. The same idea is seen in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, we as believers, as partakers of Christ, we ought to avoid all needless occasions of contention, but yet not to the point of sacrifice and truth. There comes a time when we've got to stand up, and ultimately that's pursuing a peace right there. We can't... We shouldn't sacrifice truth or compromise principle or or, or forsake duty. Uh, Jesus certainly, he didn't. He was every bit the man, you know, as he went forth and preached and taught. In Matthew chapter 10, but verse 34, he said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And what Jesus is speaking here does not contradict anything that has been said so far. You know, the truth Jesus was proclaiming would not bring in the kingdom age of peace, but rather it was going to bring conflict, but it was going to be a conflict that was necessary in order to bring inner peace or to bring that true peace to men and to nations. Paul wrote of this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. He said, in the peace of God, speaking of this inner peace, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ or through Christ Jesus. Being a peacemaker is not a matter of a, a natural disposition. It don't mean an easy going or, or a peace at any price person. It's not somebody who says uh, anything to avoid trouble. You know, none of the Beatitudes describe a natural disposition. And, and this one's a far cry from the disposition of the natural man. Also, the true peacemaker, uh, he's not an appeaser. Appeasement's just a temporary fix. You just give somebody what they want to try to pacify them a little while. That's not going to fix anything. And that's true whether dealing with conflict between nations or on a personal level. We know all of us that are parents, we know about dealing with those things about appeasement. That won't, won't mount to much. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If it be possible, Paul wrote this, if it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. <clears throat> now sometimes we want to look at this and say, well, that gives me excuse. If I need to fly off a handle, then I'll be justified in doing it. <laughs> but no, that's not the case. But the very term of this exhortation where he says, if it be possible, it denotes that compliance is its not a simple task. It's going to be a struggle at times. It's one which calls for a constant vigilance, self-discipline. It calls for prayer. Uh, such is the state of the human nature. Offenses are going to come. This whole flesh is going to rise up, going to get in the way sometime. But nevertheless, it's part of the Christian duty or our obligation to see to it that we conduct ourselves in such a manner that there can't be any just complaint brought against us or against the name of our Lord. Now, that gets awful tough sometimes. Remember, he said, if it be possible. So, yeah, it's, it, we've got to have a diligence about these things. You know, it is for our own peace that we do so. 
It's impossible to be happy in conflict and turmoil. Have you ever known someone and somebody might say, yeah, I know you, but <laughs> I hope I'm not that bad. But, you know, I, I've worked with people that just seem like they thrived on wanting to whip somebody or just, <laughs> you're walking around miserable. You know what I'm saying? You've been around it. But just living in conflict and turmoil. I mean, they're the furthest thing from peace. I mean, that's a detrimental behavior. But some believers even, they are of a naturally contentious disposition. And, you know, they need to doubly beg God to hold his restraining and common hand upon them. Yeah, if it be possible, and sometimes it's tough, but we do have an obligation to, to be diligent in trying to do right and to live right. You know, one writer, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, he described the peacemaker as one about whom we can say two main things. And he said, first of all, he said, passively, we can say that he is peaceable. A quarrelsome, contentious brawler who is boastful and proud cannot be a peacemaker. Most likely, he's going to be an instigator. And the second thing that he says is, about the peacemaker is that actively this person must be peaceful in character or intent. We already talked about that one. But also it must be one who makes peace actively. Uh, he's not content to let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, hopefully I can clarify this a little better for you in a minute. But he's talking about one that desires peace and he does all he can to produce and to maintain it. And sometimes... That's a whole lot more to it than just being a pacifist and just staying out the way and not doing anything. He's a man who actively sees that there should be peace between man and man and between a nation and nation. And most of all, he is ultimately concerned about the fact that all men should be at peace with God. And he's willing to do his part in doing something about it. You know, everything that we do in service to the Lord fits under this title of peacemaker going forth under his banner, under his word, under his guidance. All, every bit of it fits right under that peacemaker. In order to be an effective or a true peacemaker, one has to have an entirely new view of himself or herself. And it's only the man of a pure heart who can be a, truly be a peacemaker. And you recall from a few weeks ago that, that the one who lacks a purity of heart is most likely going to be filled with envy and jealousy. There must be that character of meekness. The peacemaker must be entirely delivered from self, from self-interest, and from self-concern. If this isn't so, then we'll always be looking at everything in terms of the effect that it has upon us or ourselves. And that's going to result in a selfish and a self-centered interest and that will lead to hurt feelings, misunderstandings, and disputes. Totally the opposite of being a, a peacemaker is to be self-centered, to be selfish. Uh, I tell you, the farther up a road you get uh, as a child of God, you, you just realize just how detrimental that self is to every one of us. Self, our pride, you know, it's a constant battle, always. This new view of self means that we've viewed ourselves as wretched and miserable, having seen ourselves as poor in spirit, uh, having mourned over that blackness of our hearts and having hungered and thirsted after righteousness that we're in, in such a need of. And when we viewed ourselves in such a manner, we won't be so quick to be worried about our rights or our self-interest or, 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 you know, because we see our own worthlessness. John chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And I've always thought that's, that's a very difficult passage right there. But by this saying, Jesus meant that loving ourselves in this, he's talking about loving ourselves in this natural life. We ought to be to move on past that. Uh, you know, the further up the road we go, the, the greater distaste that we should have for our natural self. Can we honestly say with the Apostle Paul, you remember he said, oh, wretched man that I am. If we can, then we can have this new view of self and this new view of life. And the result is where all that's going to lead us to is we can have a new view of others. 
And that sounds kind of kumbaya or whatever that. <laughs> Y'all know where I'm going? But this is just rational teaching from the scriptures. Practical. You know, we can begin to view others as according to the word of God and realize that there is a need for pity and mercy. Realizing that they are dead in trespasses and sin. That they're under the power of the devil. That they're walking according to the course of this world. And then it might even sneak in our that such were some of you. <laughs> yeah. That God, you know, that was me one time. And you start looking at people like that. You can develop, uh, you, you'll be a little more diligent about truly being a peacemaker. And carrying the gospel to them or witnessing to them, oh, that's the ultimate in peacemaking. You know, as soon as one begins to realize they're in a position to help, likely, then he is likely he's to make peace with him. <clears throat> and I knew this was going to be in two parts, but I'm going to have to cut this thing off here quickly. But I want to add this. You know, to be an effective peacemaker, as Jesus is speaking of, then one must have an entirely new view of this world. Uh, the true peacemaker only has one concern, and it is the glory of God among men. You know, this was the Lord Jesus Christ's only concern. No one interest in life was not, his interest in life was not himself, but it was in the glory of God. And with these new views of self, with the new view of fellow men and of the world, one is a man that's ready to humble himself and he's ready to do anything and everything in order that the glory of God might be promoted. That's a true peacemaker. And it might mean that one, you know, our feelings might get hurt. Our pride might get stepped on a little bit along the way. We might have some injustices come our way. But in doing so, peace might be produced and God's glory might be magnified. You know, such a one is finished with himself, the self-interest, the self-concern, and what matters is the glory of God and that manifestation among that among men. Now I'm going to stop there and we'll continue on next week. This is a, a rich topic and I know I've probably overloaded you <laughs> what you what you've heard, but uh, and I hope I hadn't bought about any confusion. I read somewhere that, that this is probably one of the highest forms of a litmus test of you really are a believer, this idea of being a peacemaker because we follow the Prince of Peace. He lives in us, you know, as he reproducing that life within us. Amen. Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family, and I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Oh,